All right, so it's a pleasure to uh, have uh, Jack Harris here today. He's going to talk a little bit about uh, measuring knots and braids here. Um, so Jack got his PhD in uh, Santa Barbara with David Ushlaw, and then spent some time at Harvard with, uh, well, all our friends at Harvard, particularly Samisha and uh, Doyle and, and, and uh, Wolfgang and so, and so forth. And he's been at uh, Yale since 2004. So mm -hmm. I tell us a little bit about his all, all sorts of stuff, optical mechanics and, and things. So welcome. I just put this on there. Just put it on your collar. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, if there is a question, maybe you can repeat it. Okay. Always... Yes. Okay. Uh, so thank you, uh, Wendell uh, and Nathaniel, for the invitation to be here. It's a real pleasure uh, to be in Maryland and to see you all in person. This is super nice. Um, I uh, uh, sort of, did, as uh, Wendell mentioned, I did my PhD in condensed matter physics. I did a postdoc in atomic physics. I've been working on sort of related things since then. But actually, the topic of my today, the topic of my talk today, has nothing to do with any of those subjects. And it also doesn't have anything to do with particle physics or astrophysics or biophysics or anything else along those lines. What I'm going to be telling you about today is a bit of mathematical physics. Um, and that is weird because I'm an experimentalist. And this is not normally what I would spend my time worrying about. Uh, but the math that I'm going to be telling you about is math that I bet is central to every one of your daily practice as professional physicists. And just to you know, put my money where my mouth is, let me ask you the following question. Raise your hand if, from time to time, you have to find the eigenvalues of a small matrix. <laughs> okay, so we're all in this field together. Like, we're all, this is, this is us. Okay, so... Um, uh, what I'm going to tell you about uh, sort of happened in a complicated way, but the story as I'm going to tell it to you is the following. There's a mathematical curiosity, it's a relatively simple one, um, that is maybe kind of interesting, but turns out to have uh, direct, important, tangible consequences for real physical systems. In fact, ubiquitous physical systems. Uh, the math that I'm going to be telling you about, uh, this is all sort of undergrad, oops, uh, undergrad level stuff. So the math that I'm going to be telling you about is finding the roots of polynomials. The physics it's going to have a tremendous impact on is the physics of harmonic oscillators. Okay, That's everything that I'm going to be telling you about. And the entirety of the consequences will be that uh, the degeneracies of these systems generically live on knots. And if you ask what do their uh, eigenvalues do, the resonance frequencies, as you tune a system of oscillators, it generically traces out a thing called a braid. That's everything. Um, so uh, let me uh, first of all acknowledge uh, Nick Reed, uh, whose theory group, uh, shown here in its entirety, was uh, crucial in making all of this happen. Judith Holler, I want to single out uh, her contributions. And on the experimental side, uh, these folks in my group, and here I want to single out uh, research scientist Yogesh Patil for his con contributions. OK, so let's, get, uh, let's move on to this fascinating piece of mathematics that will blow your mind. Uh, and the fascinating piece of mathematics is the following. If I think about the roots of polynomials, you probably encountered this in high school, right? Quadratic equation and things like that. Um, and I think about their solutions. As I go to higher and higher order, there is a dramatic transition where they just suddenly change dramatically in the character of these solutions. So just to remind you what we're talking about here, this is a first order polynomial. In the unknown lambda, uh, this is uh, some coefficient a and as an experimentalist, I do know how to solve this equation. This equation has one solution, whoops, uh, which is uh, this one right here. If uh, my unknown appears in a second order polynomial like this with these coefficients a and b, I also know how to solve this, uh, I don't really know how to derive it. Uh, I memorized this in high school and I use it all the time as the quadratic equation. And a recent survey shows that most people have forgotten it. I can believe that. I can believe that. OK, uh, if your unknown appears in a third order polynomial like this, A, B, C, there's still a, a formula that you can, uh, uh, it's hard to memorize. You shouldn't memorize it. But you can write it down in terms of cube roots and square roots and addition and multiplication. It's a, it's a three-valued function. So important note, the solutions of the quadratic polynomial are a two-valued function, the plus and the minus here. 
this function will necessarily be a three-valued function because you have to have three roots for a third-order polynomial. It's the fundamental theorem of algebra. Uh, if you have a fourth-order uh, polynomial, its roots involve all the same operations, but it's a longer expression. Uh, if you have a fifth-order polynomial, you can still write its uh, solution in terms of hypergeometric functions and things like that. It'll be a five-valued function involving all these coefficients. Sixth order, a more complicated special function, but perfectly well-known special functions with six values. And seventh order, it's some other bunch of special functions that happens to be a seven-valued function that returns to you the seven roots of this polynomial. You go on forever and ever, you see the pattern here. So my claim is that there's an important break in this series, very, very important break. And I, you will be forgiven if you imagine that this is the break I'm interested in. Okay. Uh, above fourth order, the solutions can no longer be written in terms of radicals and simple arithmetic operations. This is a super famous results in pure math. It's super important. As far as I know, it has no physical consequences. I don't know anything I can do in the lab to realize that my uh, system uh, uh, resonant frequencies involve these functions instead of these. If you know of a way, I would love to talk about it. But as far as I know, it doesn't matter. And I promised you that I'd be telling you about a mathematical curiosity with real physical consequences. Um, if you're a fan of polynomials and their roots, and you're wondering what's the break uh, we're going to be talking about, you might imagine that it's from seventh up, which plays an important role in Hilbert's 13th problem about how functions can be represented as compositions of other functions. Again, nice piece of math. I'm not aware of any physics. Uh, the, physic, uh, the physics uh, issue arises here when you go from second order to third order. And I would say it's not obvious in just looking at these functions that there's a dramatic qualitative difference in the solutions above the green line from the ones below, but there is. These functions all involve to topological structures in a really interesting way, and the ones above it don't. So that's the math that I'm going to tell you about, and I'll explain it in a minute. The physical consequences maybe you've already guessed, which is that if I have a system of n oscillators, its resonance frequencies are simply the roots of some nth order polynomial. So if I have two masses coupled by linear things, and uh, if I have three or if I have four, five, uh, all coupled by linear uh, things, and I just describe them using this very advanced bit of physics, F equals MA. And if I uh, specialize, uh, if I remember that I'm only talking about linear interactions, then F equals MA can be rewritten in this uh, language. You can think of this as Hamilton's equations, but it's all the same thing, where the state of the system is an n vector. If you like, the position of each oscillator is encoded in the real part, and its momentum is encoded in the imaginary part of this complex vector. And the time evolution is generated uh, by some matrix here, D. And the matrix D, uh, you know, you've done this in freshman mechanics or something like that. The matrix D has the following properties. Its matrix elements are just a simple representation of all the masses and linear couplings. Um, its eigenvalues are the resonance frequencies. That's, you would find the eigenvalues. And how do you find the eigenvalues of a matrix? You form the uh, characteristic polynomial and you find its roots. Okay, yeah. Good question, hold on to that for one second. Uh, and so what I'm gonna tell you about is the physical constant consequences of this, which is that over here, these rather familiar systems, I'm going to claim, have all this interesting topological structure in them. This one doesn't. But the uh, very good question is that all this nice math really pertains if you're thinking over the complex numbers, where all these coefficients are complex, and you're taking their roots to be complex. And is that necessarily how I should be thinking about such systems? And the answer is, it depends. Okay, so here's what I mean by that. Uh, why would I think about harmonic oscillators systems with complex eigenvalues? Um, let me begin the following way. This is the equation that I said we're interested in. And this is an equation that's so important, it doesn't even have a name. It's like the really good restaurants, right? They don't have the sign out front. This is, tells you you've made it big time. Okay, why do I mean it doesn't have a name? Well, if what you think you're doing is the quantum mechanics of closed systems, you think that this is the Schrodinger equation for n levels. If what you're doing is the uh, classical mechanics of springs and the like, you think that this is f equals ma for n oscillators. 
If you're doing circuits with L's and C's, you think this is Kirchhoff's equations. If you're doing any kind of coupled mode theory, these are your coupled modes. If you're doing open quantum systems, this is your Lindblad master equation. Okay, So we, we use this equation an awful lot in one form or another. And there are some applications where this matrix should be strictly Hermitian. If you're doing the quantum mechanics of closed systems, I have nothing to tell you. Like this talk is going to be irrelevant for you. But there are plenty of physical systems in which it's natural for D not to be Hermitian. And I'll give you specific examples. Um, and the real point of uh, people who talk about non-Hermitian systems is that if you have learned about this equation in contexts where you're assuming that matrix is Hermitian, there are some big surprises when you uh, consider the other cases, when you consider D not to be Hermitian. Some of these surprises are just related to the properties of matrices themselves. So for example, this matrix uh, will have eigenvalues that are complex, perturbation theory works different, degeneracies are different, et cetera, et cetera. These are just properties of the matrix itself. If you use that matrix to generate time evolution of a vector, there are also some surprising results. Like there's no longer an adiabatic theorem. Um, you can have non-reciprocal dynamics. Um, the way that Berry and topological phases works are different. Uh, anyway, so lots of fun things to learn about. Um, and this is important because uh, there are systems that are described by this equation in lots of physical domains, whether you're doing circuits or mechanics or whatever. And we use these things for doing lots of uh, scientific and technological tasks. So this comes up a lot. In my particular talk, this is what I'm going to be telling you about, this one little corner of it, which is the fact that uh, the spectrum of such matrices have interesting topological structure. Um, we won't have time to talk about this, but that's where we're working towards. Okay, so what do I mean uh, by all this? Again, my claim was that a, a this system of n linearly coupled things is described by this equation. Here's a, a matrix that might appear in there, written out just completely generally. Um, if this system really just consists of masses and springs, or if you like the electrical domain, these things, then that matrix will certainly be Hermitian, and the eigenvalues will be real, and all that nice math that I told you about doesn't really apply. On the other hand, if you live in the real world, uh, there's no such thing as a system that consists just of this. If you live in the real world, and there is, let's say, friction, and there is a Coriolis force, the Earth is rotating, there are Coriolis forces, <laughs> uh, then, uh, or if you are, are an electrician, you think of these elements, then this D matrix can literally be any matrix of complex numbers. There's no constraints on it. Okay. Another way of saying that, if this, you know, if you say, well, I've never seen this in McMaster car, and I've never seen this in McMaster car, another way of saying that is if you take the other point of view, you can make an arbitrary uh, matrix. If someone gives you an arbitrary matrix, you can make it out of these linear things. So this is the most general a set of linear couplings. So in such a system, uh, if all I care about is the spectrum of resonance frequencies, the only thing I care about is the characteristic polynomial, which depends on these nine matrix elements for a three-mode system, um, but it itself only has three coefficients. So the C coefficient here is some combination of all these nine things. The B is some combination. The A is some combination. But at the end of the day, if what I want to talk about is the spectrum, I only care about these three coefficients, however I get them out of these nine. Now, when you first talk about the things that were going to make this non-permission, yeah, I was um, uh, gratified to hear things that were dissipation. Yeah. And then you said Coriolis for it. Yeah. So could you just say a little more? Yeah. So uh, dissipation will break time reversal symmetry, but not reciprocity. So the Coriolis force or the Lorentz force uh, is needed to... So uh, if you like just introducing damping, We'll make this non-Hermitian, but it still leaves you with a symmetry across the diagonal. Uh, I think in the complex part, I forget, like there's a Hermitian and anti-Hermitian part. Um, uh, so do you need both? In yes. Order to... In order to, in order, so just dissipation will make it non-Hermitian, but to have access to any complex matrix, you need uh, Coriolis. Yeah. Uh, well, you mentioned that it would be any complex numbers, but presumably there's some physical constraints that the solution should blow up exponentially with time, so you shouldn't have a growth. Oh, constraint. there's no such constraint. So, but what is the actual? 
uh, the displacement of these oscillators. And I've, if you like, look, uh, any real physical system, this equation will only be an accurate model so long as x is small. And in that case, if I have exponential growth, I shouldn't trust this equation's time evolution for too long, but it's perfectly capable of describing linear gain. But that would put friction. Not the, friction. The, the friction can have a negative. So this thing can have any sign. Yes. <laughs> yep. Gain loss. Yep. Yep. And also, I'm sorry, so, but so maybe you're going to cover it, but with the non permission matrices, so eigenvectors have le left and the right eigenvectors. Yep. So why do you write this equation as opposed to the other one? Uh, because th you can write it in terms of, uh, so I haven't written any eigenvectors here, but it is multiplication from the right that generates this. Uh, in this talk, we're not going to, in the interest of time, let's talk about that later. In this talk, Eigenvectors are going to play no role whatsoever. I'm going to be talking entirely about the spectrum. Question. Yeah. yeah. With all I've seen the question about exponential yeah. growth, uh, I was saying like the information. Oh, sorry. System, yes. Like, there is a scenario where we can start from like perfectly closed system, but still end up with complex like, like eigenvalues. If you think about sweeping physics, so is that going to be included? Um. <laughs> Yeah, I think you have uh, introduced, you've probably gotten your non, uh, well, you probably use something like this, or you have traced out. I know what you're talking about. Uh, like, if you're thinking about squeezing and quantum mechanics, just, no, take a deep breath. Like, I'm just talking about F equals MA. So, it's okay, like, maybe we can talk about that afterwards, how it maps onto this. But for now, like, this is all super simple. This is undergraduate physics and undergraduate math that I'm going to be telling you about. So we're not going to allow temporal modulation on the first conception? Correct. Yep. Uh, okay. Okay. And so the main point of what I want to tell you about today is that when you tune these coefficients, uh, you are tuning the resonant frequencies. And we just want to understand how do the resonance frequencies depend on these coefficients? Typically, these are the things that we have access to in the lab and via them here. And what we're interested in often is the resonance frequencies. Okay, so again, resonance frequency are the, are the roots of a polynomial. If you have an n-mode system, uh, you'll have uh, n coefficients in your polynomial here. But uh, for everything that we're going to talk about, the trace of the matrix doesn't really matter. If you like, the trace just takes the entire spectrum and translates it. We're not super interested in that, so we'll always take the trace of the matrix to be zero, and that gets rid of one of these coefficients. This coefficient is always the trace of the matrix. Okay, so when I think about tuning a spectrum, the number of controls that I have are these n minus one complex numbers. In the lab, I don't see so many complex dials, so I make them out of two real dials. So I have two n minus one real controls. And so if I think about the space spanned by these uh, controls, every point in this space is a specific polynomial. And when I, it tells me what all these coefficients are. And once I write down, once I know what polynomial I have, I can find its roots, and they will be n roots in the complex plane. This is what I'm going to be telling you about. Everything is, is here already. So let me now ask the following questions. Suppose that I start with uh, some particular um, polynomial, like this point here, and I change it. Maybe I can think of this as a function of time, but not like real dynamical time. I just ask what happens to the polynomial as I go around a loop like this and come back to where I started from. And there are a couple nice results that we can uh, say right from the get-go. So if we imagine doing this, one result is that whatever the spectrum is at the start of this procedure, it's the exact same spectrum at the end, because I have the same polynomial. There are some other nice results, which is that this spectrum depends smoothly on uh, parameters up here. So I know that for some small little excursion from this point and back, each one of these eigenvalues will only change by a small amount. And we might imagine something like this. This is what the eigenvalues do to start from the original spectrum and come back to the original spectrum. On the other hand, uh, I can think of a slightly different loop like this one. And if it's very slightly different, the smoothness of the dependence between these two things means that the eigenvalue trace will be very similar to what it was for the very similar loop. Uh, on the other hand, if I think about a very different loop, like one that makes an extremely large excursion here, these eigenvalues will generically make very large excursions. They have to vary smoothly as I go around the loop from here to there. And this set has to come back to this set. 
But all those conditions are satisfied if the evolution of the eigenvalues in between looks like this. Okay, smooth evolution, the set returns to itself, but something interesting is happening in here. And if I do some very different uh, loop, uh, uh, like this uh, red one here, again, smooth evolution, set comes back to itself, but something very different happens in here. So this evolution of the eigenvalue spectrum is what's called a braid. It's n things being mapped smoothly back to each other, uh, and those n things regarded as being unordered. And in some sense, this is the first half of what I want to tell you about. So this is the generic evolution of an eigenvalue spectrum, that you make a loop in your control space, and your eigenvalues will make a braid. But one question might be, uh, if that's the case, what determines whether I get a braid like obviously distinct from a braid like this and distinct from a braid like this? How can these braids be so different when these loops can all be smoothly transformed into each other? Like there's no topological distinction between these loops, but there is between these braids. So in order to see what's going on here, let me use the magic of PowerPoint uh, slide animation to just smoothly deform this red braid into this blue braid just by force. I'm going to force this one. If you watch, here it goes. I've just uh, made this look like that. And if you look what happens, what it involves doing is that these two strands, in order to change the, identity, the character of this braid, these two strands have to be forced through each other. They actually have to pass through each other at some point. And up here, I was showing you what happens uh, as I uh, to the loop. What do I have to do to the loop to go from this braid to this one? And I'm just deforming the red loop into the blue loop. And so what you can see from this is that in order for, to change the character of a braid, um, the strands must be forced through each other. And when the strands are forced through each other, what that means is that your control loop at that point is at a degeneracy. You ever get a threefold degeneracy? We'll come to that in a minute. Yep. Um, so. Uh, if this red loop produced a braid of one character and the blue loop produced a braid of another character, that means there must be a point in here where there's a degenerate spectrum. These statements are equivalent. Now, just to make sure that I'm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm yep. following this, uh, I'm thinking when you're telling me about these eigenvalues in complex space, mm -hmm. that uh, the, the, uh, the real imaginary part is telling me the frequency of the damage. Yep. And what you're telling me is when I get a degeneracy, that both the yes. frequency and the yes. damping have to be Yes, that's what I mean by degeneracy. And that's what I mean by degeneracy throughout, uh, full complex degeneracy. So that now provides us with a clue as to what it was that was differentiating this red loop from this blue loop. There was a degenerate point somewhere in between them. Yeah. But this two roots, doesn't it just reduce the quadratic equation? And then because who cares what the data looks are doing? I just see x minus x1, x minus x2. Like, I don't see how the other part is going well. I'm not sure. I, under, I don't understand your question. You're you switching two loops. Uh -huh. Why do you care what the other loops are doing? Isn't this just quadratic equation? That... Sure. You can say these uh, these two are not very interesting right now in the story that I'm telling. Fine. That's fine. Yeah. But you could have a cubic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is, I'm just, this is for arbitrary, and I'm just telling you the story. OK? And so it's true. Uh, but look, if I wanted to go from this braid to this braid, I might really have to maneuver three or four of the roots around. OK. So yes, to go from this braid to this braid, I only had to pass through a double degeneracy in this particular case. OK. On the other hand, this can't really be the answer, because a, a point here, a degenerate point, can't actually make a topological distinction between this red loop and this blue loop, because there's a lot of dimensions here. I can smoothly deform this red loop into this blue loop by just avoiding this thing, just going around it, so to speak. So uh, that's not quite enough, but uh, we're saved by the fact that the condition of degeneracy is one complex equation. So its solutions will always be a surface that has two dimensions less than the full space. So in this cartoon, where I have a, a cartoon of three dimensions, that means degeneracies are generically a one-dimensional curve. And a one-dimensional curve definitely can make for topologically distinct loops in this space. So this is the kind of structure we should be thinking about. And I guess there should be another bunch of degeneracies here if this blue loop is topologically distinct from this green loop. OK, so to sum it up a little bit more precisely, every loop that avoids degeneracies um, produces a braid of eigenvalues. 
And specifically, if you, you will get topologically equivalent braids from loops that are topologically equivalent, sorry, in how they encircle these degeneracies. So if I took this blue loop and deformed it, but in a way that it still ran around this orange curve, I would still get a braid of this topology. Um, so this is the essential story that I wanted to tell you about. Um, but uh, at this point, I want to try and draw a better picture. This is a cartoon. It's qualitative. It gets everything essentially right. But there's definitely more to learn here. Um, OK. So uh, just as a quick recap here, if I think about the space of polynomial coefficients, um, that space is pretty boring. It's just n, 2 n minus high dimensional Euclidean space. But it consists of two subspaces that are kind of interesting. There's the space of all the degeneracies, and we want, might want to know where they live. And then there's the space of everything else, which is where we want our control loops to exist. And in the cartoon version, we know that the degeneracies are definitely two dimensions less than the full space. And control loops seem to care about how they encircle these degeneracies. That would, that's what determines what braid they produce. Um, so is this a useful thing to have? Uh, what we have here, again, is a, ca so, uh, a catalog of all the topologically distinct loops in a space. What I've said is that every topologically distinct kind of loop corresponds to a topologically distinct braid. This turns out to be an immensely powerful thing for characterizing a space. It's what's called the fundamental group of that space. And just as a quick introduction to what this means, um, if I wanted to tell you about uh, our regular three-dimensional Euclidean space, and uh, I, its fundamental group, again, is a catalog of how many topologically distinct types of loops there are in this space. And in this space, they're all the same. I can deform all of these loops down to a point. So the fundamental group uh, of this space is the trivial group. If we think about a more interesting space, like the surface of a sphere, like you can go around the sphere. The airplane companies will sell you a round-the-world ticket. But you should demand your money back. Because the surface of a sphere is also uh, trivial in this sense. Every closed loop can be is topologically equivalent to a point. Same deal there. We don't have to look far, though, to find spaces with non-trivial fundamental groups. For example, the plane with a hole in it, um, this blue loop, starting at this black point and returning to it, can't be smoothly deformed into this red loop, which is the same except that it goes around the other way. And it turns out that. I can characterize each loop by the integer that is how many times it winds around this hole. This is known as the winding number. There's one more important thing, though, which is that this thing, the fundamental group, is a group. So it has both a set, which is the set of all topologically distinct loops, but it also needs an operation that's closed on that set. And the operation that's used in characterizing these spaces is just loop concatenation. You do one loop, and then you do another loop, and you regard that as itself a loop. And you ask, what's the relationship amongst them? So let me consider a loop that consists of doing this blue loop first, and then this red loop. That's this purple thing here. And if you look, uh, it does have to start and stop at the black point, but otherwise we're free to do whatever we want. And as a result, I can deform it back down to a trivial point. And so if I concatenate two loops in this space, um, the new resulting loop is just the sum of the corresponding integers which is why the space has as its fundamental group the integers in the sense of both the integer numbers, but also the operation of addition. Again, you don't have to look further to find something that's richer. Um, this space here, a twice punctured plane with hole A and hole B. Um, if I consider a starting point like this black one, and I go uh, consider the blue loop A and the red loop B, these are both perfectly legit loops, and now let me concatenate them by doing first loop A and then loop B. This is what I have. On the other hand, if I do loop B first and then loop A, this is what I have. And my PowerPoint animation skills are petered out here. So I will leave it to your imagination to convince yourself that you cannot smoothly deform these into each other, but you can't. So this is a space in which loops don't commute. So whatever the operation is, it's not addition. Um, so that's to say that this uh, space, uh, and that also the loops are not characterized by a number. If you put a bunch of loops together, you get something that sounds like a Swedish pop phenomenon. Uh, and so this is an example of a space whose fundamental group is non-abelian. And the reason that I'm telling you about this is this is what happens for os harmonic oscillators when you have more than two of them. 
OK, so again, in the previous examples, what I did was to draw you a known space and then sort of argue about what the fundamental group should be, this one or this one. In contrast, what we have in our physics problem is uh, we don't have a picture of the space. What we have instead is the fundamental group. Because what we puzzled out in the previous slide was that every loop uh, out here corresponds to a braid of n strands. And it'll be the same thing when you concatenate loops. It's just like concatenating braids. There's a total equivalence between them. So we're in the opposite situation where we know what the fundamental group of our space is, uh, but we don't have a picture. So what we, I'd like to do in trying to draw you a picture of this uh, is to do something wonderfully clever, like just reason. Uh, but I don't actually know that you can do that. Uh, so instead, uh, we fall back on brute force calculation. And it's not that much brute force. Uh, it's really just a couple lines of algebra. Um, so let me come back, back to the case of a two-mode oscillator, where this is its characteristic polynomial. Remember, we don't have the uh, first order term here because we're assuming tracelessness. This polynomial has just one complex coefficient, z. So the space of all such things is the plane. Um, the only degeneracy is when z equals 0. So the degenerate point is just the origin. Um, if I want to draw this space, it's just the plane, and my two control knobs are the real and imaginary part of this complex number. The degeneracy is just the point at the origin. And so this is literally just what we talked about before. This is the once punctured plane. So any loop in this space is either like this uh, red loop, in which case the eigenvalues make a trivial braid, because this says winding number zero, or this blue loop, which goes around minus one times, or well, maybe plus one times, causes the eigenvalues to twist once. And if you were to go around uh, 17 times and then come back to the starting point, you would see a braid that twisted 17 times. That's everything that's going on here in the two mode case. Um, OK, so any loop is characterized by its winding number integer, and concatenating two loops just adds to those winding numbers. And that's all I have to tell you about the two mode system. It's summarized up here. It's in the three mode case that it gets interesting. Remember, this is where the break happens. Uh, why is that? Well, here's the most general characteristic polynomial for a traceless three by three matrix. X and Y are complex numbers. So there are four dimensions for these uh, polynomials. Here's how we could regard them. Here's their four dimensional space. You have to imagine that I've drawn four dimensions here. If I ask where does this root, where does this uh, polynomial have triple degeneracy? It's only at x and y equals zero. And I have to solve lambda cubed equals zero, and that's the only threefold degeneracy. But we know that the degeneracies have to constitute a two dimensional surface. We're in four dimensions, there must be a two dimensional surface. So that must be, uh, the remainder must be the twofold degeneracies. And it turns out there's a nice way of finding all the degeneracies of a polynomial, which is in terms of what is known as its discriminant. So whenever these coefficients x and y stand in this relationship to each other, that polynomial will have degeneracies. So all I have to do now is to say, well, OK, where in this space is this equation satisfied? And it's such an amazing result. It's so cool that I'm actually going to show you the algebra. Because again, it's only like two or three lines of algebra. So I want to know where in this space does this equation hold? And uh, let me switch from kind of Cartesian coordinates to a polar representation of each of these coefficients, uh, a modulus and a phase angle. And then let me, just for the time being, just work on the surface of a sphere, of a three sphere, with radius epsilon. I'm not going to assume that it's small or big or anything else, and we'll throw this assumption away in a minute. The fact that we're working on a three sphere and the fact that uh, x and y have to satisfy this relationship fixes the magnitudes of the two complex numbers. It's not very interesting, but you can solve for them. Once their magnitudes are fixed, the only thing we haven't solved for is their phase angles. If you have two phase angles, you're talking about the surface of a torus. So somewhere in this space is a, uh, a torus, and it's on that surface that we need to pin down the solutions. Well, it's not very hard, because if you need y cubed to be equal to x squared, you need 3 times this angle to be equal to 2 times this angle. And that consists exactly of this curve here. So this is one of those angles running around three times when the other one runs around two times. This is what's known as the 3-2 torus knot or the trefoil knot, very familiar uh, design. OK, so that's all the algebra there is. And what it tells us is that on this three sphere, the twofold degeneracies form a trefoil knot. 
And that result would hold regardless of which three sphere I picked. So if I picked a smaller sphere, there'd be a smaller trefoil knot. And if I picked a smaller sphere, there'd be a smaller trefoil knot. And they, you can sort of imagine them extruding back to a point, which is where this threefold degeneracy is. So that is the structure of the degeneracies of a three-mode system. Uh, it has a name. This is what's called the cone of the trefoil knot. And uh, it has real physical consequences. Uh, one of them uh, is that it's just awesome. If you have like a three-mode system and you look for where the degeneracies are, you'll find that they live on a trefoil knot. Like I've been taking a lot of data in my life where a trefoil knot emerges. That's kind of cool. Um, also, what we know is that if you uh, imagine tuning your system around a loop, your eigenvalues will trace out a braid of three strands. We already knew that. Um, but that which braid it is depends on how this loop intertwines with this knot. And there are a lot of ways that loops can sort of wind through a knot. And it's this richness that makes those braids not commutative. It means that they can't be represented by integers. Um, anyway. OK, so this is now the recap. L equals 2 is sort of trivial because it's just winding numbers around the degeneracy. Uh, N equals 3 is non-trivial because the degeneracies themselves form this sort of extrusion of a trefoil knot, and they result in a non-abelian fundamental group. Uh, I will not go through N equals 4, 5, and 6, in part because I have no idea how to draw it. But I can just tell you that all the qualitative features are the same. The degeneracies are a knot-like structure. The remaining, remaining space is non-abelian, and the eigenvalue braid you get from a loop is determined by how the loop winds through this knot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah. uh, what do you draw the quadratic coefficient in this equation? Mm. Tracelessness. Okay. So then this is fundamental. I mean, I'm a bit confused because in four dimensions, not such a trivial as far as I remember. So you have a three knot is trivial, but this is not a three knot in four dimensions. This is uh, the cone of the trefoil knot. So, uh, in fact, it's actually what I tried to draw here. Oh, no, let me go back. Um, so, yeah, okay. So, at every radius, there's a trefoil knot. So the entire thing is a surface, a two-dimensional surface, whose every cross-section is a trefoil knot. So this fundamental group of what? So when it's, the, by, by one, it's the fundamental group of the complement of the degeneracies, the fundamental group of the non-degenerate space is B3. Yeah. So one possible source of confusion might be that this, this trefoil knot is a knot made up of a line. There's no surface there. Uh, what I've shown, the knot itself is certainly a line, but what you have to imagine in your four-dimensional... surface formed by... By, by extruding it, line. yes. Right. But of course, the way you've drawn it, it looks like the knot is a surface. This is not my fault. This is the three-dimensional universe's fault. <laughs> that surface can't be embedded in three dimensions. Sure. But the way in which the, the line is shaded suggests that it has... Uh, I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. <laughs> you know, suggestions are welcome. Improvements are 100% welcome. So that's what I'm trying to draw here. Like the knot extruded, the knot is extruded back down to this point here. So it's a two-dimensional surface in a four-dimensional space. Yeah. S3 minus the trefoil knot is actually the same thing as this the space of lattices. So okay. You're modeling my modular flow space. Okay. But, but, uh, please tell me more about it afterwards. Yes. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear about that. Um, okay, so, uh, right. So what was I going to say? This is... Uh, all the interesting things that we want to talk about are already here for n equals 3. And what I should say is, like, this math has been understood for more than a century. Uh, and as an experimentalist, my job is not to verify it. Like, it's just true. It's just math. Uh, on the other hand, if a really ubiquitous physical system, like a lot of things in this world, in theory land and in real world, are made out of coupled mode systems. And if such systems have a, let's say, underappreciated mathematical structure, it would be nice to see it in real life at least once. Because as you point out, my PowerPoint skills are, are limited. OK, so what experiment should we build? It doesn't matter. You could do this. Here are three modes. And my claim is just that if you tune maybe these springs and their dampings or something like that so that you get four tuning parameters, you will find that the two-fold degeneracies live on these trefoil knots whoops, and uh, have the structure that I was just describing to you. In practice, it turns out to be nice for us to make tunable oscillators by having a little vibrating uh, square and just using its normal modes as our three oscillators. 
There's no fundamental reason for this. This is just what was easy in the lab. These are certainly three harmonic modes. Uh, we tune them and couple them by putting them inside of an optical cavity and filling that optical cavity with laser light. Again, no reason to do this. It just is, turns out to be very convenient and, and practical, which is a weird thing to explain, but it's true. And so what we do is uh, uh, basically what happens is that the radiation pressure in this cavity can stiffen and soften and dampen these modes, and it can couple them together. And it just turns out that by controlling the uh, various laser lights that we send into this cavity, we have a nice realization of those four knobs. And in, pr in practice, what happens is we send in three different laser tones. And if you vary their powers, one, two, three, and then fix their relative detunings, but just shift them all like this, that turns out to map nicely onto these four control parameters. No fundamental reason why it should be, but it's, you know, it's just an apparatus, and it, that's what it does. The experiment itself is you know, complicated, but at the end of the day, I told you everything you need to know about it. Um, so the way it works is the following. We uh, fill the cavity with laser light, fixing those three laser powers and their common detuning. And then we just measure the resonance frequencies of this little sheet of glass. That's all we do. We shake it and we measure how much it moves. And we fix that, uh, we fit that data. And from that data, uh, we extract uh, the eigenvalues. If you like the width, here are the uh, contributing resonances in different colors. And their center frequency is the real part of an eigenvalue. And the width is the imaginary part of the eigenvalue. So that gives us three points in the complex plane. That's what I wanted. That's, this is the whole thing now that I wanted to tell you about. So uh, here's that four-dimensional space of those parameters. If we uh, pick one point in there, we have one uh, system, uh, one uh, characteristic polynomial. The first thing that I want to do is to convince you that these four experimental parameters actually span the space of interest, that it actually uh, spans the space of all the eigenvalue spectra. So to do that, what I have to find first is the triple degeneracy, that one special point that everything unfolds from. And so to do that, what we do is we slice through this four-dimensional space by varying uh, the different parameters. It's just practical for us to take data densely in these sheets. Each uh, point in this sheet, we measure an eigenvalue spectrum. And what I'm going to show you is the perimeter of the triangle of these three eigenvalues. Because that's a quantity that's only 0 if the three eigenvalues are equal, if you're at the triple degeneracy. And so scanning around in three of these planes, it looks something like this. Uh, if I put those three planes together in three-dimensional space, this is what they look like. This bright spot here indicates we're close to a three-fold degeneracy. But in a four-dimensional space, there are actually four distinct ways to do this. So here, assembling all those planes in the uh, various ways that are allowed. And what you can see is that at this point, there seems to be something like a third-order degeneracy. So having convinced ourselves that we know roughly where it is, we're not trying to sit on top of it or anything like that. It's a set of measure zero. That would be hopeless. But we know it's somewhere around here. What we want to do now is to go on some surface that surrounds that, measure the eigenvalue spectra, and find what the two-fold degeneracies on that surface are doing, because my claim is that they should be a trefoil knot. So in order to do that, uh, we just have to take data on the surface, uh, the three surface, surrounding this one point in four-dimensional space. That surface ends up looking sort of like this tesseract -y thing. It's not that hard to imagine. If you ever tried to explain the surface of a box to your friend in two dimensions, we can do exactly the same thing with this surface here. It consists of eight three cubes that are arranged in such a way that's hard to represent faithfully in three space, but which you can represent in this tesseract -y type of structure, which uh, correctly encodes which uh, boxes are touching which. It's just a stereographic mapping, if you like. Um, the reason that this is nice is that each of these boxes we can associate with one of our real experimental in-lab knobs, like laser powers and detuning, um, in the following way. This is an animation that my students made. So what we do is we actually raster, say, our three laser powers in this volume, fixing the fourth parameter, and take spectra at lots of points all inside this box. And then we do it for bunches of other boxes, but we choose those boxes so that they have certain faces in common. And then we imagine in the software having taken all that data, stitching all those boxes together, and then just smooth, applying a linear deformation to all that data such that we get this collection of eight boxes where each box is sensibly labeled by some real experimental parameter. This is just a nice way of showing the data. 
So we take uh, data in, in this family of parameters. Again, this is a three-dimensional region that is a faithful representation of the three-dimensional surface uh, surrounding uh, the triple degeneracy. We take data on all these, lots and lots of data on all these sheets, about 30,000 spectra. And I won't show you those 30,000 data points. The only thing I'll show you is the ones in which we identified a twofold degeneracy. So those uh, twofold degener, oh, anyway, this is a typical uh, measurement on one of those sheets. This is uh, eigenvalue difference, so to speak. So that point is a degeneracy. Anyway, we find that. And then when uh, I just point, uh, put those points back on where they were found on those sheets, this is where all the twofold degeneracies that we've located happen to lie. And it's a little hard to see in just one view, but you can see when we spin this around that the twofold degeneracies trace out a trefoil knot. So this color is a real thing. Uh, so you can tell that like these blue twofold degeneracies are totally distinct from these orange ones, even though they pass close to each other. So this is the first thing uh, that I mentioned, which is that uh, quite generically, here it is in a just conventional stereographic projection. And any three mode system of coupled oscillators if you can explore the entire space of its spectra, you will find twofold degeneracies that lie on a trefoil knot. Here's that. The other thing that I had told you about was that if you ask what the eigenvalues do as you vary those parameters, my claim was that the eigenvalues should trace out a braid where the specific braid is determined by how your loop encircles this knot. So here's our data uh, with the fit as the orange line through it. And now what I'm gonna do is since I took 30,000 spectra, through this entire volume, I'm just gonna plot those spectra for you that happen to lie on this green loop. So here they are. Each uh, sheet here is a complex plane with the spectra measured, one, two, three eigenvalues. Then as it turns out, we had about 20 data points, 20 spectra measured on this green loop. So I'm just plotting all those uh, eigenvalues for you as we go up like this. And it's a braid, it's a boring braid, but it's a braid. On the other hand, it's a boring loop. It doesn't really enclose the knot. Here's what uh, the microscopic theory gives you. Here's the same thing where I just select all those spectra that happen to lie on this red loop, which does enclose the knot, and you get the eigenvalue spectra making a non-trivial braid. If I plot the spectra that lie on this blue loop, which encloses the knot in a different way, you can sort of convince yourself it's grabbing two strands instead of one, uh, you get a topologically distinct braid, distinct from this one. And all of this is a very robust feature of the data. These are not like cherry-picked loops. Here are a bunch of other ones. If you just sort of draw a crazy loop through the data, like this green one, and then plot all those spectra, this is what they do. If you draw this crazy loop, you get a distinct uh, braid. If you draw this crazy loop, you get this distinct braid. So there really is a one-to-one -one correspondence between topologically inequivalent loops and topologically inequivalent braids. Yeah. So you've got some that are topologically equivalent, but look very different. Yes. Uh, so we a paper just came out in Nature Communications like yesterday, uh, going through those examples using the same data set. Um, so the last, very last thing, this is the last real slide I'll show you, was that uh, one thing claim that I made was that these braids would be non-commutative, and that that simply reflected the geometry or topology of a space which is three-dimensional space minus a trefoil knot. So to show you that, here is uh, the measured locations of the twofold degeneracies. Here's a starting point in black. Here's a red control loop. And here's the blue control loop. If I take all the spectra that lie on the red loop and plot them, and then I plot all the spectra that lay on the blue loop, this is what we get. If I plot the exact same data for you, but the blue data first and then the red data, I get a totally different braid. And you can see that it's different because, for example, in this one, the middle eigenvalue ends up on the left, and here the middle eigenvalue ends up on the right, just by plotting this data, same data, in a different order. So this is the non-commutativity. Okay, so that's, uh, that's really it. Just as by way of conclusions or summary, um, you know, we've probably been solving simple polynomial equations since high school. I remember, I remember seeing the quadratic equation for the first time. It was in high school. And I remember the teacher saying, yeah, there's something called the cubic equation and yada, yada. I didn't really remember anything else. That's where I first bumped into that. Coupled harmonic oscillators, you know, this is first year undergraduate physics for sure. I still do it all the time today. I think most experimentalists and theorists build things out of these. Um, and so anyway, this mapping is very well understood to all of us. 
Um, but the thing that has been less well appreciated is in the particular case, and this is not for everybody, where you're considering general linear couplings, arbitrary linear couplings, uh, there's this very nice uh, mapping between all the fun mathematical results, and in particular, the fact that uh, for three modes and more, your eigenvalue spectrum has this interesting topology. And uh, uh, experimentally, this is real measurable thing. This is not like Abel Ruffini or Galois group stuff where it'd be very hard to measure anything. This is like, I measured this. Here's a braid. I measured a different braid over here. It's because of this story. Um, in terms of going a bit further, remember I said at the beginning that like non-Hermitian stuff, uh, some things are just interesting because the kinds of matrices you're dealing with are different. And that's everything that I told you about today. We just asked, given a matrix, what do its eigenvalues do as a function of parameters? We didn't even talk really about this equation. What kind of time evolution might be generated by such things? And in particular, one thing that we're interested in is asking the following question. Can I get a situation in which an actual physical state can be transported in a way that is influenced by this braid structure? So what I imagine is starting with, say, a four-mode system, just drawn as a cartoon here, in, with one particular uh, setting, and then uh, initializing, actually preparing the state of the system in one of its normal modes, and then executing some kind of loop, this time in real physical time while the system is ringing. Um, I know what the eigenvalue spectrum does. It makes out a braid of some kind. And if I could appeal to the adiabatic theorem and do this very slowly and say, hey, I expect my state to be transported along the state that is smoothly connected to, I should get uh, a state at the end of the operation that's over here if I do the blue loop. But if I do the red loop, the exact same uh, initialization, initial state ends up with a final state over here. This is a very robust form of control because it means that what I get as a final state is determined only by the topology of my control loop. It's very robust against little errors and this and that. This does not work. This does not work because the adiabatic theorem and its derivation definitely requires hermeticity. Um, on the other hand, there are a lot of control sequences that do things like this without using appealing to adiabaticity. There's shortcuts to adiabaticity and counter-diabatic driving. So we're in the process of learning maybe how to apply those to non-Hermitian systems to engineer a system that does this, that follows the strands of this braid in a useful way. And uh, we're certainly interested in the question of what kind of phase might be accumulated along such an operation. Is there a story analogous to Berry phase? Uh, for this, you just have to stay tuned. Okay, so that's everything. Let me wrap up by thanking our funding agencies, for sure, uh, the graduate students and uh, research scientists, Yogesh, who uh, carried out the experiments, who explained all of this to us very patiently. And actually, before, uh, I just want to mention one other thing, which is totally unrelated. Uh, but if you came here wanting to hear about quantum mechanics and are sadly disappointed, I wanted to mention to you uh, an upcoming workshop that's going to be held on the island of Helgoland on the precise centenary of Heisenberg's famous visit there, which you could regard as the birth of quantum mechanics. Uh, and anyway, uh, the workshop is already uh, in progress. And if you'd like to, to join, uh, we'll be taking applications shortly. Anyway, just something to keep in mind. But uh, regardless, thank you very much for your attention and uh, look forward to chatting with you. Before I forget, at 4 o'clock, students post up. We'll have time with them in uh, 2117. So please keep that in mind. Question, yeah. So um, other than... Oh, 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 oh go ahead. Okay. <laughs> And um, so um, uh, you nicely showed that you need like 30,000 spectra. Right? And then you touch them on, I think this question was at the end of your conference. Can I come up with a physical observable that is associated with this brain and hope that it would be robust or it would, it would manifest somehow this uh, braiding? That, yeah. There is no hope because there is no gap and there is no. Well, okay, so you succinctly... It's an classical, it's... Well, it's just, it's math. I mean, it doesn't really matter whether it's classical or, or quantum mechanical. Again, like, to be clear, like, that equation that I showed you and told you was the Schrodinger equation, and f equals ma, et cetera, et cetera. Like, it, it really doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't always matter. It's mm -hmm. classical. Yeah. Can I associate physical observation? Yeah. Uh, maybe. 
So uh, for a, to associate a physical observable with a loop, you know, you have to do the loop. So having done the loop and knowing what your initial state is, like the uh, question of which state you end up in would be an observable, uh, except that the adiabaticity doesn't apply, so it's not so great, but maybe we can find a way to stabilize transport along a braid. Um, if you could just, you know, is it shaking like this or is it shaking like this at the end of the operation as your observable? More subtle would be like, is there a phase associated with, you know, which braid you executed and which strand you were on? That would be pretty cool also, but I don't know if there is such a thing. There's some more questions again, and then you go. But, so Nick had this paper about uh, maybe about a transform the space of Jordan blocks. Have you guys? Nick and Judith and me, yeah. Nick and Judith and you. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. Nick, yeah. I, you know, Nick gets all his best ideas from me, so. <laughs> Not true. Not true. Yes, that experiment is underway. Yeah. Okay. So maybe this is the same question that Mohammed asked, but I'm I'm trying to think that that except for the fact that obviously this is way cool. Okay. Yeah. Uh, why should I care? And so one of the things I'm thinking is, well, you know, ions in a, a linear ion trap are a couple mm -hmm. oscillators. Mm -hmm. uh, is there some way of using this in a uh, a quantum gate that's going to be robust uh, against uh, decoherence? Uh, now, the decoherence sounds like the non-hermission part, but of course, I want to avoid yep. decoherence. Yep. So I'm always trying to make my system as hermitian as yes. possible. Yep. And so it sounds like like going into a non-hermitian thing is just the thing I don't ever want to do. Yep. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I'm not here trying to pitch you a new qubit. I'm not <laughs> pitching you a new quantum computing architecture. Uh, if you really like closed quantum systems, I don't even have anything to tell you. This is all irrelevant. So this is just an amazing bit of mathematical physics that is relevant. You know, you mentioned, uh, so like if you do adiabatic rapid passage or if you do any kind of landau zener physics and your system is a little bit lossy, chances are that got swept under the rug at some point and you told some nice story. This is the story that puts it all back in. No, you know, no approximation kind of does it honestly. Um, so you might learn something there. Um, whether there's a win in the qubit world where, yes, mostly the introduction of loss just means bad things happen. Right, but it's always there. Yeah, so yeah, way yep, dealing correct. With it. I don't know. It would be wonderful if somebody were to puzzle that out. Cater Merch at Washington University in St. Louis is doing experiments where they have a three-level system. They keep track of the two-level systems. If you condition on no jumps into the third one, you get effectively non-Hermitian evolution. And they can see a lot of the stuff happening with the uh, state vector density matrix that you would assign to that system. I don't know that they would claim they're doing anything useful, but they're seeing it happen. Um, if I was to claim that this might have something useful, it would really be in classical control. You know, in, in parametric oscillators or synchronized networks, when you think about making transitions between states, maybe there's a way to uh, exploit this to get really robust kinds of transitions. If I had to, if, if you were a venture capitalist and I had to like get some money from you, that's the only thing I could say. But mostly, it's just cool and interesting, and it's a big surprise to find in a system that we all use. Perhaps for detail question, but um, all the eigen, all the uh, numbers you're extracting at each point is from a single uh, slice of data, right? And then you do that over a large range of uh, power. So can you, uh, what is the confidence on the three complex numbers that you're extracting from the Lorenzian? Yeah, you could get a sense of that. Um, I mean, sort of the, you could do you know fancy error propagation and all that, but uh, you can get a sense of that just by looking at the scatter in this data here. Um, and I should have made rotating versions of these so that you can see that these strands are really very far apart from each other, but they are. And, you know, just the scatter here is a pretty good sense of the of the reasonableness. And if I go back way back, if I go way back, you you know, you'll see the actual resonances, and like we can that's have extremely high signal to noise. Whoops, and they fit very well to this three mode system. We have a lot of constraints, uh, so in the details, these modes are actually not at all degenerate, and they never become degenerate. The only reason they look degenerate is that there are beat notes in the cavity whose frequencies are close to this, 
And so they're only degenerate in a Floquet picture. It's the quasi frequencies that we're studying. That's okay because it's all the same physics and all the same math, but it's just too much to put in the experimental details. But when you measure in the lab frame, you actually measure at frequencies near here, but you see kind of the dress state copies of these resonances, and that's what is showing up in here. Then when you measure near this frequency, you see the dress state copies of the others. So there's a lot of constraints built into this fit. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so there are really only three modes here, but you get nine Lorentzians. And so it's very highly constrained in the fact that it makes good sense and agrees with the fit. And then all the theory that I was showing you, like, uh, like this theory down here, this is what you get just by measuring the optomechanical parameters, the stiffnesses and the cavity finesse and blah, 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 and just grinding out the standard uh, classical cavity optomechanics theory. Um, so it seems like we understand it at a microscopic level, the signal to noise is very good and it's a very stable system. Okay, there's one more question before I ask the question. Jack's giving another talk tomorrow. So if you find this cool, he may have something else to say at 11 o'clock. 136 PSC. Okay. How rich is the space if you get rid of dissipation but keep the non reciprocity uh, interesting behavior? So that's just uh that's just okay, so the non-reciprocity gives you so let me just think about it in two modes. The non that's just uh R3, uh, because the non risk that's just the Pauli matrices, that's the Hermitians. So if, if you just have masses and springs. Uh, you really have sigma z and sigma x, each with real coefficients. Non-reciprocity gives you sigma y, all with real coefficients, and then dissipation mixes with mixes in with those and gives you, you know, the Pauli matrices are still a complete basis, but the dissipation now lets you put complex coefficients in front of them. Um. Okay. Well, thank okay, you. Thank you. <laughs>